What's up, Geminites? It's your boy, Gem Mint, here with a new segment called uh, Omnibus Spotlight. I want to do a segment where we highlight some out-of-print books that are very hard to find, give a chance for viewers to see the book inside and out, take a look at what it's going for on eBay and Amazon, and also uh, do some education. A lot of people ask me in the comments, do these, do these books ever go up in value? Are they worth anything or what? So stay tuned. <laughs> All right, so the first one up is the X-Men Volume 1 by Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Roy Thomas, and Werner Roth. This is the Silver Age uh, run of the X-Men, issues 1 through 31. And it's completed in Volume 2 from 32 to like 60-something, I want to say. Uh, we've talked about this a couple times, you know, in a live show or in our Jumping On Point video. But basically, the first 60 issues or so of X-Men were original stories. They weren't selling well. They started reprinting those issues until issue 93 was the last reprint. Then you had Giant Size X-Men 1, and then uh, X-Men 94 was the all-new, all-different. But enough about that. This book uh, is one of the reasons why I got into Omnibus. I used to collect CGC issues, and I was trying to get key issues... And yeah, you uh, you can't read them, right? They're in those slabs. And I did want to read the books, but you know it can be very expensive to hunt uh, hunt down raw copies. So an omnibus like this collects all those original issues in pristine format. It's oversized, so they're bigger than regular comic book issues. The pages are not dirty; they're clean white. They're reprinted and recollected in this easy on the eye edition. When this came out, it only had a cover price of $100, and we'll take a look online to see what it's going for now, but I'm sure it's a lot more than that. I think I paid like 300 bucks for this. It's the only Marvel Omnibus that I know of that has a matte finish on a dust jacket. It's kind of thick, and it's not glossy at all. So if you buy this and you think, oh man, did I get a fake uh, dust jacket? Because that's what I thought. Uh, I looked into it, and um, no, it just happened to be how this one was printed. Uh, another noteworthy thing about these old, older omnibus, uh, first of all, they always did these black kind of classy leather bound type of hard covers with this silver embossed um, font and logos. And the paper stock during these times was a lot thicker. Um, this one is not as bad as the uh, Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1. But my Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 is like this thick, and the pages are like little square cardboard cutouts, man. It's like, they're huge. But like I'm flipping through, and you're getting the first appearance of Juggernaut. We'll, uh, let, we'll look right now. What do you get in here? So, issue 1, obviously, you get the first appearance of the five X-Men, plus Professor X and Magneto. Issue 2 is the first appearance of Vanisher, throwaway uh, villain. 3 is the first appearance of The Blob who is recurring. In the 90s, I thought he was bigger than what he was, no pun intended, but as uh, part of the uh, Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, of part of the Freedom Force. Uh, issue 4, you get the first appearance of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, which includes Toad. Um, is that Mastermind? I forget that guy's name. But more importantly, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Uh, then we get... You get some characters that you don't see anymore, like Eunice, the Untouchable Man. Uh, then you get Avengers vs. X-Men for the first time ever in issue 9. Issue 10, you get the first Silver Age appearance of Kazar. No big deal. Then we got a biggie. Issue 12 is the first appearance of Juggernaut. Issue 14 is the first appearance of the Sentinels. <laughs> issue 19 is the first appearance of Mimic, which not didn't really become anything. Uh, issue 28 is the first appearance of Banshee. And that's pretty much for like the noteworthy issues, I would say, that are collected in this book. But these Omnibus have a, a certain print run. I don't know how much it is, but they printed however many of these they printed, and then that was it. So what happens is when the distributor Diamond sells out, 
It's only available in the shops that purchase them. When those shops sell out, you're only able to buy these books through other collectors. And that's when that's what we call like the third party market, eBay or Amazon, right? And we all ha we all know how that goes on eBay, man. Everybody wants to break that sales record of the last book. Uh, it is very hard to get a hold of these whales, is what we call them. A hard to find book, a sought after book, and the omnibus collectors world are called whales. Uh, similar like statues like that are hard to find or whatever are called grails. In the slab world, we call them grails. But uh, it's whales, like the white whale, Moby Dick, the one that always got away, the hard to catch book. Looking on eBay right now, there are no available copies of this for sale. If I go to sold listings, I search the X-Men Omnibus Stan Lee. The spine is the X-Men because just X-Men is the uh, Chris Claremont 90 stuff. There are no recent sold listings for this omnibus either. So let's go to Amazon. And I remember having this problem when I was trying to buy this book. It's not that it was too expensive. You, it just wasn't available for sale. Okay, so the X-Men Omnibus Volume 1 on Amazon, it looks like they do have some available. Six used from $553. One new from $549. Dang. So to answer that question, a lot of people will say, do those books ever go up in value? Yes. We buy new Omnibus through in-stock trades, and they are 50% off cover price. So somebody could have bought this from in-stock trades for $50, free shipping. When Diamond sells out, and then in-stock trade sells out, that's when you start to see these books go up in value. Now, I don't recommend buying these books for investment purposes, because... What can happen is that for Marvel could decide tomorrow, especially with the Fox-Disney merger recently being approved, they can decide, let's reprint all that X-Men material in omnibus format because we know there's a, a demand for it. And if they reprint this and you can get a second printing of the same exact thing for 50 bucks, this one will not sell for 300 bucks for 500 bucks anymore. Maybe it'll get a little bit of a premium because it's the first printing, but... It's not like single issues, man. Omnibus collectors don't care what printing it is. We just want the book. We just want the material because we want to read it. So that's the difference, I think, between those kind of collectors' mindsets. Um, we just want to read the book. So a lot of times you see whales like that, like Infinite Crisis Omnibus was going for 600 bucks, And I believe that first print still sells for the same as the second print, which is under cover price now. I personally have no intention of selling this book, but man, you never know. One day I might decide to let loose on everything. So it, it's kind of nice to know that it's more valuable than when you bought it. But like I said, they could do a reprint and throw that whole plan out the window. So I think that's enough about the actual book itself and uh, the price and all that kind of stuff. Let's take a look at the actual artwork from an aerial view and take a look at some of the Silver Age original X-Men issues. All right, I didn't really mention, but I, th I thought it was pretty obvious. The cover of the dust jacket is the actual cover from X-Men 1. Uh, that was another big selling point for me. And a lot of the later volumes offer two covers. A regular cover, which was usually more modernized. Uh, I think this one even has an Alex Ross uh, homage cover. Or the DM or direct market variant cover was the original one. So I always tried to go for the original old school covers because I liked it to match the interior of the book. And as a CGC collector, it was kind of like scratching that itch of having the original copy because the front of the dust jacket was the same cover. I don't know. Makes sense in my mind. So most of the early Marvel Omnibus had that red logo up top with the black spine, which I like. It's very uniform for... The display but somewhere along the lines we started doing white spines or graphic spines or colored logos instead of just the white text on the spine but you know it's comics nice bright colorful it's all good i'm a big fan of having all the covers of the issues on the back it's cool to be able to glance and see them all side by side like that 
Short little introduction by LA Times, $100 cover price. So obviously selling for much more than that now. All right, here goes the hardcover. We kind of already showed a lot of it, you know. At the time, it was just very cool for me to see the, the original artwork and read the, these original stories in this type of format. Here you go, you get the cover of the issue. If you bought a low-grade reader's copy right now, first of all, it's going to be thousands of dollars. Second of all, it's going to be dirty. It's not going to be as clean as this is. It's going to be a newspaper-type comic paper. So I just feel like this format was just so awesome to reprint this material. So there goes the first panel ever of Magneto. Angel used to tuck his wings in his shirt. That looks super uncomfortable. Marvel, I always like how they show the actual cover of the... Uh, issue before they get into the story. DC doesn't really do that, and it's kind of uh, frustrating. I want to know what issue I'm reading. I want to look at the cover. You know, I want that whole experience. Here goes the blob issue. Quicksilver. What, you didn't see me? Eunice, you don't really go anywhere with that guy. Also, um, they reprinted like the soapbox editorials and like the letters. So that was really cool to see. Like you can see what this guy, Rick Albright, who lived on Lincoln Street, wrote to X-Men in the 60s. That's crazy, man. First appearance of the Juggernaut. Kane Marco. Professor X stepbrother who is actually not a mutant. He just got powered by the gem of Cytorac. I don't know how I know this crap. <laughs> there he goes. And it's actually continued in issue 13. Because the Sentinels, they even have Master Mold early on, which is a huge Sentinel that makes the other Sentinels. There he is right there. This was a cool all red cover. Big splash page, Angel. Angel's actually not an original creation. He was part of uh, the Golden Age Marvel stuff, uh, Timely stuff. That's cool, too. Him, Human Torch, and the Submariner, along with Captain America. Part of the Invaders. I don't know if I should do a video for Volume 2. It's kind of like the same thing, and I feel like this was just more iconic. Although it is a whale in itself. I don't know. Maybe we could. Then these covers were all the reprints. Like the Marvel Tales reprints of the stories in this book. Who says this isn't the Marvel Age of Comics? Like the ads. That was cool. I think this was actually like a very early appearance of Spider-Man. That's a Kirby cover too. But look at this. You get original art pages. I forgot about this. Original covers. Uh, alternate covers. 
X-Men 10 unused cover art by Jack Kirby and Chick Stone. Unused cover for 25 That's cool, man. I guess these are reprints. Returning for yet another reprint. Original Avenger, uh, Adventures of the X-Men hit newsstands again in 1994 with X-Men in the early years. Okay, that's what that was. What's up with these splash pages? More reprints. All right, guys, so that's my first Omnibus Spotlight on the X-Men Volume 1 by Stan Lee. Hope you guys enjoyed it and found it informative. Uh, I do plan on doing more of these. I have uh, quite a few whales that I uh, would like to you know, show you guys in more detail. If you, if you have any requests, let me know in the comments below and I'll consider it. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you're alerted when I do drop new content because I do release a video every day. Um, always comic related. Sometimes it's uh, a spotlight on a book. Sometimes it's a statue. Sometimes it's a CGC issue. Sometimes it's a Comic-Con video. So uh, always something fresh at Gem and Collectibles. You guys stay minty.